Good afternoon, everybody, uh, to our second webinar. Uh, today we're talking about herbicide resistance in onions, but probably also in other vegetable crops. And we're really lucky to get the specialist on that topic, Dr. Peter Buzalis, to uh, talk to you. So we will uh, go through a PowerPoint presentation and um, you can ask questions by typing in your panel on the left hand side. Uh, and we will answer questions if they're really urgent. Uh, we might ask Peter to answer as we go, but uh, we will leave some time at the end for questions. So please um, collect a lot of questions for Peter while we go. Um, and I guess we give it a start. Peter, you can say, say a few more words about your background. I think that you know that better than I do. Okay, thank you. Doris, I'm uh, just moving my screen things over. Good so I can see. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Dr. Uh, Peter Butalis, and I've been involved with herbicide resistance for the past sort of 30 years. All from um, initially, I, I did my PhD on the first cases of herbicide resistant weeds in a, in Australia. I then went overseas and worked for um, Seabird Geigy in the herbicide area and, and resistance and new herbicide discovery and I've come back to South Australia about 15 years ago and I'm working for both the University of Adelaide on herbicide resistant and identifying resistance and understanding resistance and also have my own business in called Plant Science Consulting where we conduct um, commercial resistance testing for farmers but also do a lot of uh, pot trials for companies that want to test their new herbicides. So we're pretty involved at the current time. So hopefully everyone can hear that clearly. I'll just move on to my first slide and that is just to get some basics out of the way and what is what we're going to talk about. The first one is how common resistance exists before a herbicide is ever sprayed. And that, that's what we call the frequency of resistance. The second one is selection pressure. So how some weeds require hardly a few, very few treatments before you get resistance, while others you need, we've been still spraying herbicides and we've got no resistance to them at all. So it depends on the herbicide intensity and also the weed numbers. So the more weeds you have, the likely is a chance that there is a resistant individual or individuals out there and they'll be selected for resistance. Talk about the complexity of re resistance in ryegrass called multiple resistance. Some, something about herbicide resistance testing and we'll go through some of the herbicides that are available um, post and pre-emergent herbicides for onion growers and some testing. So the aim of today is not to tell you guys what herbicides to spray but to give you uh, some understanding of um, how resistance occurs and what things need to be checked before you go in blind into to grow a crop. So resistance is the inherited ability of an individual, a plant to survive, produce seeds and um, after being treated with a lethal dose herbicide. So it's not the, um, some weeds aren't controlled with certain herbicides and that's because um, mother nature doesn't make them, makes them survive. So that's not resistance. It's not weed escapes either. So it's the inherited ability of an individual to survive and reproduce after being ex it's exposed to a lethal dose of a um, chemical. So what's ha what's been happening in Australia for the past 30, 40 years? The weeds that have the most resistance are annual ryegrass. Winter grass in golf courses is resistant to many different mode of action herbicides, so herbicides that kill in different ways. And um, then there are some others below. In the broadleaf sense, we have wild radish in Western Australia, but also fleabane across the country, which is resistant to many, many herbicides. And another one which could be causing grief is a common sow thistle. I'll also like to hear from you guys in the comments later what other weeds that you would consider are problematic weeds um, to control in onion crops. But from the little experience I've had in onions in, in Southern Australia, annual ryegrass is one of the, the most serious weeds because 
it's not responding to herbicides because of resistance. So here's just an example to highlight to you that term I mentioned before, and that is the frequency of resistance. So here is a photograph of some broadleaf weed, and naturally it's purple flowered, but there is an individual in there that's white flowered. That's just showing us a visual genetic diversity. In the other pot, that's annual ryegrass. And once in a while, we, we get an albino, that little albino towards the back. So that is, there's a genetic reason why that plant is an albino. There's genetic reason why the broadleaf weed is, is white, is an albino. And that's a visual genetic difference. Plants also have internal genetic differences, which some of them just by chance happen to make them herbicide resistant to her to um, chemicals, to herbicides. So when herbicides are used against them, they don't die. They're not very common, but by using a lot of herbicides, we kill all the susceptibles, allow the resistant ones to survive, set seed, and then dominate the, the population. So here's just an example that we used. If we have um, a density of one plant per square meter, which is very, is, is basically almost zero, and you have that in a 20 hectare paddock field, and I know that I've looked at some onion crops which are actually bigger than 20 hectares, but in a 20 hectare, you have 200,000 plants and 0.2 of them will be resistant. If you have 10 plants per square meter, uh, you have 2 million weed and two of them will be resistant. So you can see by that demonstration that the more plants you start with, the greater is the chance that there are resistant individuals in that population. And if herbicides are overused, they will survive and set seed and then dominate the population. And I've just, I just took a photo and put it on Twitter earlier this morning, where we collected 100 ryegrass samples from last year. And 40% of those are 40 percent of that ryegrass, so 40 paddocks where we collected the ryegrass, were resistant to glyphosate. And that is an increase in a tenfold increase from five years ago where the, we detected 4 percent, it's gone to 40 percent. So there there's been a huge selection in five years resulting in lots of glyphosate resistance in southern Victoria and that's causing some mega problems for those growers. So we start with a paddock and we've got this little cartoon here shows us we've got an initial population with acceptable plants, but we've got a little green plant that's resistant. Herbicides are sprayed. If they're allowed to remain and set seed, then it dominates after a few years and then you have a, a real prob problem. So <clears throat> Lots of resistance in annual ryegrass. It's the number one weed in Australia by far. It's resistant to most herbicides. There are some populations which are resistant to most herbicides. The so farmers are running out of um, um, choices to control weeds, to control that weed. So it's very important to know your cropping history and your herbicide history. So if you are in a situation where there's been a lot of herbicide used in, in previous crops, putting a, a crop in, such as an onion crop, which you have no idea what the resistance status is, is extremely, extremely risky. Um, I visited this onion crop here um, last year, and it was a 30 hectare pivot, and it was they sprayed a high rate of clethodim, and it didn't work didn't work at all, it was full of weeds. And so the left-hand side of that uh, photo, you can see they've actually gone in and tried to hand weed the onion, the, the ryegrass out of the onion crop. So major disaster. And basically what happened at the end is they gave up and they just um, killed, they, um, killed the entire crop. So if they had conducted a simple resistance test, they would have, they could have avoided this. So going into an area which you don't know if you've got resistance or not is risky. If there's been a lot of other herbicides used in a lot of crops and they're using similar herbicides to what you're 
you, you use in onions like, like clethidine, then it's a high risk. And in, because if herbicides such as clethidine are not an option, then it may be worth conducting growing an onion crop in another area if you don't have the, the herbicides to control it. Because in this situation here, they lost over a half a million dollars by this um, failure. So we've been visiting Southern Australia for the past sort of 20 years and collecting weeds at random. And what we're finding is that there's a lot of resistance to the FOP herbicides and their herbicides such as Verdict or Targa uh, Fusillade, which are herbicides that you may know from onion crops. Uh, to group D herbicides such as Stomp, there's a um, fair bit of resistance in South Australia, but in other areas it's pretty good. The group A DIMS, like Clethidim, there's um, not that much resistance in most areas. And glyphosate, there's a little bit occurring, but not that much if we look at the entire South Southern Australia. Um, it's interesting to note that the, we'll mention it later, but the FOPs and the DIMS, so the two graphs on the left, they have exactly the same mode of action, which means they kill weeds exactly the same way. But ryegrass, we've got lots of ryegrass, has resistant to the FOPs, but the DIMS such as clethidim work. So, um, yeah, it, it's quite mysterious why that happens. We understand why that happens, but assuming that if you if a FOP doesn't work, that your DIM won't work is not entirely true. It, it may work, but you need to do some testing to, to verify that. So this is another map here, which shows how many modes of action ryegrass is resistant to. So we see here the yellow spots are the ones where ryegrass is not resistant. The green spots is where ryegrass is resistant to one mode of action. So that could be it's resistant only to say stomp and nothing else. Two modes of action. So the light blue is it could be resistant to stomp and clethidim. And as you move further and further down and you, you head towards the orange and red, that's where the ryegrass is resistant to a lot of different modes of action. So you can see there are areas there um, that it's quite difficult to control ryegrass with um, herbicides in, in such certain cases, especially in the southern states where it rains more and there's more ryegrass. So some of the factors that increase herbicide resistance are using the same herbicide every year. It works initially, but after a while, certain species of weeds, for example, like ryegrass, can evolve, become resistant quite easily to it. And it took, took ryegrass up to, we started using glyphosate, for example, in 1970s, and it wasn't until 1996 in an orchard in, um, when was it? It was in southern New South Wales that the first case of glyphosate resistance occurred. So it took several, a few decades for resistance to start. And once it started, it's now increased almost exponentially. Like I mentioned earlier, where we've got lots of um, ryegrass resistant to glyphosate in southern Victoria um, last year. Right, herbicides have different names. You've got Targa, you've got Fusillade, you've got Clethidim. They are all what we call group A herbicides. They target an enzyme, the same enzyme called ACCAs. So if you're rotating between Targa and Fusillade, ryegrass doesn't see it like that. It sees it as exactly the same chemical. So you might be changing the name, but you're not changing the actual way that you're killing that ryegrass. So it'll be, it will develop resistance to Targa and Fusillade. And ryegrass that's been sprayed only with Targa in a paddock and never had any Fusillade tested on it, sprayed on it, if we, when we, where we test fusillade, it's resistant to fusillade as well. So it's very important to know. But clethidim sometimes works because even though it kills the same way, it's it, the chemistry of that herbicide is, is quite different. Low rates or reduced kill rates also fast tracks resistance. So if you've got other conditions, you might be using the field rate, but if there's other conditions which um, are suboptimal, to the herbicide working, that's like spraying a low rate. And what that happens, what happens is ryegrass will survive 
of that lower rate and then they cross pollinate and they accumulate those mechanisms and the, the next generation has a combination of those resistance mechanisms and that usually results in much higher levels of resistance. So things that low rates or reduced cure rates can be things like poor application, stressed or large weeds. So if you're spraying large weeds, you need higher rates to kill larger weeds and you, you need small weeds. Also, if they're stressed, we just had a frost um, in some areas in South Australia yesterday, areas um, like in Narrow Court, I heard yesterday they had minus two frost. They grow onions down that way. If you're spraying clethodim under those conditions, clethodim just doesn't work very well under frosty conditions. So weeds might survive. They're not resistant or they may have very weak resistance. If you had applied clethodim, you would have killed them. But because um, of the frost, they've survived and they will grow, cross-pollinate, and the next year's seed will be much more resistant. There's also some poor quality herbicides. So there are some herbicides that are um, a bit sus suspicious, very cheap herbicides, uh, low quality herbicides. So even though you might be spraying the actual rate, correct rate, um, the product is very poor quality. And you've also got um, poor quality adjuvants as well, and also using poor quality water. Um, currently in Western Australia, where it hasn't rained, got a phone call before, they're having to use their dam water. Their dam water is very muddy, so they're trying to work, find ways to use that water, but make it work as much as possible because they haven't got access to any other water to spray, spray their crops. So you need very good quality water, or if the water is very hard, hard water is no good. So you need to add components such as ammonium sulfate that combines and precipitate those calcium and magnesium ions and softens the water, which then makes the herbicides work a lot better. So that's also very important. So all those factors can reduce the actual kill rate of the herbicide. Um, so planting an onion crop. I went through and had a look at all the herbicides that are registered in onions and it's, there's not a lot there. So you want to make sure that when you're using a herbicide, it will control that weed. So what I, I offer a service herbicide resistance testing and what that does is it allows you to identify which herbicides are still effective and the ones that are effective can be used in the crop. But it also identifies which herbicides are ineffective. So you don't want to waste and sacrifice an entire crop because you've grown it assuming you're going to use this herbicide and it's going to work and it fails and then you have a massive disaster. So with herbicide resistance testing, we can identify effective and ineffective herbicides. Um, and then using effective herbicides to control the weeds. Um, when growing a crop such as onions, which is a quite a non-competitive crop, it has very poor competitive ability, growing a crop that has low weeds, and that means that it can take several seasons to actually prepare that ground. So you reduce the amount of weeds there, so then you don't have to use, um, you're not desperate to use a lot of herbicides to control it, especially if they are resistant. Uh, there may be other, other ways of reducing the selection on resistant weeds, such as mechanical weed control. Um, mechanic, mechanics kills any weeds, doesn't matter if it's resistant or not. Or using non-selective herbicides before. So using things like glyphosate, if you know it works on your weeds, or paraquat to try and kill as many Flushes of weeds. So if you're in an irrigated situation, you can actually water up, get the weeds up, spray them with a non-selective herbicide that you know um, works, and then maybe do this a couple of times to reduce the amount of weeds that are there that are going to potentially grow in your onion crop. So um, yeah, it's all about not leaving any survivors because once survivors, they are usually the resistant ones. And they are the ones that are creating the massive effort for the following season. So it's, it's so critical to, um, there may only be a few plants there and you think, oh, they're not really competing, but they're the ones that if they're resistant, then they will create the problem for, future, for the future. And uh, broadacre farmers, they are really cracking down on very few weeds left at the end of the season to minimize, get, 
back to almost zero weed surviving, so then they can start fresh the next couple of years. Um, in in um, uh, West. Can I interrupt with a question? It's probably more than yes, one. Yes, you can, Doris. Of course. Okay, so there's um. A question from Tim Groom asking whether the resistance is actually based on one gene or several genes in um, in ryegrass. Okay, um, in it depends which herbicide you're talking about because all the herbicides are based on different genes. But for example, clethodim is based on one gene, and that gene is called or that the gene is a template that is used to produce an enzyme called ACCAs and, and Fuselade, Verdict, Targa, Clethodim inhibit ACCAs, one gene. If that gene, if, where the herbicides bind, if there is a change there, what, what we call a mutation, the herbicide doesn't, bind, doesn't recognize where it has to bind and it doesn't bind and you get target site resistance. Okay, that makes so, sense. So that is one gene as well. There are some other herbicides. Glyphosate, for example, single gene. That gene is called EPSP synthase, and it produces um, an enzyme called EPSP synthase. Um, it's the EPSP gene, and if that gene has a mutation where the glyphosate binds on the protein, you have target site resistance. Other other we other herbicides such as um, tropherulin and some of the other residual herbicides have multiple genes targets and so if you're resistant to one the herbicide still binds to the others and then you don't have resistance so we'll go through and just discuss a few of the residual herbicides okay so so the uh, single gene resistance is also a reason for quicker. people often use higher rights it occurs it quicker yeah, and, and people higher rates of a, of an active ingredient doesn't make a difference. That's right, absolutely. So, yep, we've got some some populations um, that have come through testing with clethodim. The registered rate is between two hundred and fifty and five hundred mils per hectare. We've got populations that we germinate the seedlings in our pot trials. They're very healthy when we spray them at the three leaf one tiller stage, and they've been surviving at rates as high as two liters per hectare, which is almost is five to tenfold resistant. Yeah. So, so that's how far. Yeah. Does it make it worse if you if you use the higher rates, or it doesn't matter? It's just a waste of money. Um, sorry, if you use the label rate. No, if you use uh, more than the label rate. Which is tempting. If something doesn't die, you use more. Yep. Um, so that's it, never going to whatever, work. Whatever. It, yeah, it's irris irrespective of the rate. The, the problem is if you use a high rate, um, it means that any susceptible ryegrass will be killed, like very, very well, and any resistant ones that are there will survive. And, and if you're using a high rate, they may be heavily damaged because the the type of targets or resistance they have is um is quite weak for that rate the key is if those plants survive and and cross pollinate they accumulate those mechanisms and the next generation is always more resistant that's okay. the problem it's the survivors that are, are left behind that are causing the resistance okay thank you Pleasure. And um, that's why um, in broad acre farming, growers are using um, seed capture techniques, such as um, mills, which have been integrated into harvesters. So the light fraction that comes out that was normally thrown out the back, and that consisted of weed seeds, are put through a, a mill and the seeds are churned up and destroyed before thrown out the backs to try and reduce the amount of live resistant weed seeds going out the back. So there's two types of, um, I'll characterize herbicides in two different categories. One are the post-emergent herbicides, and they're um, things like the group A's I've mentioned, Targa, 
bislaid, uh, clethodim. There's a lot of different names for an active like clethodim. There's a hundred different clethodims that you can buy in Australia that have different names. Select platinum and there's another 98 of them. Um, and it's always, always um, important to buy good quality products. And the way you know good quality products is buying them from reputable companies. If you're buying them from dodgy companies, then um, if something's very cheap, it's usually cheap for a reason. That is because they're using shortcuts, cheaper solvents and cheaper reagents to try and um, cut costs and then sell that herbicide, but it doesn't work in, in, the, in the field. Um, so basically, unless I'm mistaken, to control, selectively control ryegrass and some other grasses in onions, it's only those group A herbicides. There's no other way to control them in a post-emergent sense um, that I know of. Um, at, at the sort of pillaring stage. Broadly weeds, there are some herbicides such as gold or oxyfluorphan, and we don't have any resistance to that mode of action in Australia. Um, Asulam, which is a very old herbicide, that's also broadly weed selective and um, group C chemistry, and that is things like cyanazine, arxanil, linuron, methabenzothiazuron. So they've got a lot of trade names, but they are the actual chemical names, and they kill the same way. Um, so for broadleaf weeds, the control is pretty good because we don't have a lot, of, we have virtually no resistance to those herbicides. So if they're used correctly, then they can do it at the right growth stage, then they can control uh, broadleaf weeds in onions quite easily. Drink of water. So actually, Peter, um, uh, I would like to ask the audience whether they're actually seeing uh, herbicide resistance. So if people could please, in the audience, just click yes or no, it would be just interesting to see whether, how many people actually have a problem. Yes. Could uh, our audience please, uh, you must see the poll now. Could you please answer the question? And, and another question would be if, is ryegrass the, the main problem weed or what is the main problem weed in onions? Okay, um, uh, we might have to set that up and ask it uh, a bit lighter because uh, we have to first type it in. Yes. But thanks for the. Uh, um, Thanks for it. So I close this poll now and we do another one about ryegrass soon. Okay. <clears throat> so residual herbicides. Residual herbicides usually have multiple ways of killing a plant. So they don't target one enzyme. And so resistance to re residual herbicides is a lot less or non-existent compared to some of the post-emergent herbicides. And they are more problematic to use in some conditions. And often you're spraying it on the soil, so you don't see the weeds. So it doesn't look like there's any weeds there, but herbicides, one of my favorite herbicides is pendimethalin. It's a pain in the backside to use. It's Everything goes orange, but it's it controls so many species of weeds, broadleaf weeds, um, ryegrass as well, if it's not resistant to pendimethalin, lots of other, lots of other weeds. So it's a, by using a residual herbicide, what you would do is you'll kill a certain percentage of what was going to germinate and be um, exposed to a, a post-emergent herbicide. So with a pre-emergent herbicide or residual herbicide, you're taking, you're controlling a big proportion of, of what would germinate, and so. When weeds germinate later on in the season, after there's no more residual herbicide, it'll be less. So when you're spraying your post-emergent herbicide, you've got less exposure, you've got fewer weeds. So the chances of selecting for resistance is a lot less than if you're starting with a massive, massive density of weeds that would be there if you hadn't used your residual herbicide. Um, and there's some, Different ones, um, group J's, you can use um, herbicides such as ethofumosate, um, some of the trade names are Matrix and Tramat. Tra um, that also works well on a lot of weeds, including um, ryegrass and some broadleaf weeds. Propoclor, 
is another one, a different mode of action, group K, a completely different mode of action. So they're, they're critical to use in combination with selective herbicides. So what you're trying to do is several tactics in the same season to try and at the end come out with very few weeds at, at the end of the season. Um, and that's what broadacre farmers have to do. They have to use a lot of tactics in a single season over enormous areas. Like, oh, so we're seeing a fair bit of resistance occurring in I just saw the poll. There's um a lot yes, of yours. yep. A lot of suspicion. So having these tactics, multiple tactics in a single season, is a way to minimise what gets left that's going to grow in, in the crop. Um, and broadacre farmers are using up to five tactics in a single year to try at the end, come out with very little. And they're doing that over, you know, thousands and thousands of hectares, but they're still doing it to try and um, come out on top because um, there's no other choice. Once upon a time, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you could spray one herbicide and it controlled your weeds and you had nothing else to do in terms of controlling um, weeds. And that that horse has bolted now and now it requires several tactics, otherwise it just doesn't work. So I'll go through and just discuss a little bit on, on herbicide resistance testing, what, what kind of um, testing that is and, and what material we can use. I have a, um, all the testing gets done through a website, plantscienceconsulting.com.au, you can see that down the bottom. So all testing gets um, registered through that website and then um, we, we conduct the testing. So we've got lots of um, you've got situations in the paddock where you've got weeds that have survived the herbicide, some weeds that have that have died. You're suspicious. Why haven't those weeds survived? Are they resistant, or was there some other factor that caused them to survive? That actual photo, the top left-hand side photo, I took that photo about 15 years ago. It was prior. It was in very early autumn. Uh, and the farmer sprayed that ryegrass and um, with glyphosate, and it was. A, I took the photo because it was a clear photo showing glyphosate resistance. I took those green plants back to the lab and tested them, and they came back as not resistant. And to this day, I still don't understand why, because it looked like it was clear resistance to me. So, what appears in the in the field, you know, what you, what you've noted in that poll, that seventy odd percent resistant some of those may not be resistant maybe due to other factors and it's good to know so you can try and optimize those and, and get better weed control but basically um, plants can be collected from the field um, there's just a demonstration there one farmer just collected them put them in a plastic bag and has express posted them to me so express post so they get to me within sort of three days and even if the plants are big and old we separate them right out make little cuttings out of them, plant them into pots, allow them to regrow for a week. So even though the plant was old, we have now new roots and new shoots, and we spray them in a herbicide spray cabinet and um, get a result within within another two or three weeks. So it's, that's called a, a resistance quick test, and that's we're doing that at the moment. And those weeds are coming in from all over the country. So what can they be? They can be things like um, seedlings germinating in the field, um, tillering plants, um, even seed from soil. We can extract the seeds from soil, but most, most of our testing occurs as um, seed, comes as seed that's, that's collected prior to harvest. Um, we can test grass weeds. We can even test broadleaf weeds from the field as well. And there's a photo on the bottom left of a grower pulling out some broadleaf weeds to send to us for testing. And um, if there's contaminated grain in, in a situation where there's grain with weeds in it, we can extract the weed seeds out and grow them up and test them for, for resistance as well. So there's quite a few different um, ways we can test for resistance. Um, we can test plants, we can test seeds, and e even soil in certain circumstances. 
So I've got an example here of the table, the resistance table that would be in a typical report. And this is one from a grower where he sprayed three rates of glyphosate, uh, Basta, Amitrol, Gramoxone, and Stomp. So this is from a vineyard. And what is uh, he's identified that to one litre per hectare glyphosate, 85% of those plants arrived. And I gave it a double R rating, which means those plants were stunted a little bit, but they were growing quite well. When we increased the rate to two litres, we controlled a fair few of them, but there were still 30% um, of them that still survived and they were still quite healthy looking. So there it shows different types of resistance that's occurring in that situation um, to glyphosate. However, when we increased to four litres, we, we cured them all. So we got complete control. So you get a, what we call a dose response to increasing the rate. We also see that with clethodon, we get a dose response as well. Now, if you can kill every weed, you will never increase the level of resistance. But if weeds survive, like I mentioned earlier, that's when the problem starts. When we change the mode of action to some other herbicides, we found that, for example, to Basta, we had no resistance. To Amitrol, we had resistance because that farmer had used Amitrol for 30, 40 years as well. And so it shows up in the resistance testing. But the other modes of action herbicides, such as um, Gramoxone, we've got complete control. And also to Stomp, we did a, a pre emergent test and we found that they worked as well. Um, some of the, the photos I've got there, the one on the bottom left, that is an example where the farmer, uh, we did a test and at one litre per hectare of glyphosate, we, every plant survived, it was, it was damaged, it was stunted, but it survived and that would set seed. Increasing the rate to one and a half litres, we got complete control. So in some, some cases, in, increasing the rate works, but there are other cases where it doesn't work. So, and that differs on the, on the genetics. And the only real way to know that is to conduct a test and see if that's the case in your particular situation. Uh, I'm just thinking we might just ask another question of the, at this side. Um, if people would like to answer that, you know, how much, what is actually the main problem? Uh, unfortunately, our poll doesn't give us many options, but it would be just nice to know whether it's rye grass and the grass or broadly. If yeah, that would be excellent to know. That would really be excellent. But the answer is pretty simple. No, not yet. I'll share the poll once we finished. Um, here we go. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So, rye grass yep. is one of the. And the reason. Yep. Sure. Yep. And, and the, the, re, the reason. <clears throat> the, the reason is. Whoops. Yep, so the reason, the reason is because of herbicide resistance. Once upon a time, 30, 40 years ago, um, you could spray a single group A herbicide, you could spray Verdict, and you got 99.99% control. We, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, we obtained seed from uh, organic farmers, and we, we obtained millions of seeds and we sowed, sowed the seeds and tested them with herbicides such as Verdict and found that one in half a million plants was resistant. Okay, so that's a very low frequency but using that herbicide every year you rapidly rapidly kill the septables, leave the resistant and that is why today 83% 80, of growers, uh, onion growers, are having problems with controlling ryegrass because of that multiple resistance. And it, it's just a complex, it's, it's a real beast. Now, other weeds don't have the complex genetics. Ryegrass is so genetically diverse, um, not visually, but biochemically, genetically, it's very diverse that you have two plants next to each other and they may be resistant to different types of herbicides. One might be resistant to say Verdict or Targa or Fuselade and the one next to it is resistant to Stomp 
and you're guaranteed that if you collect seed from either of those plants next year that the, that seed will be resistant to both verdict and stomp it accumulates those mechanisms ryegrass so it's it's because it's it's what we call an obligate outcross so it must cross pollinate to produce fertile seed so other weeds most other weeds are self pollinators they just pollinate themselves but ryegrass is a cross pollinator so when you're receiving pollen with other resistances to the mother plant then the seed for the next generation has got combination of those resistant mechanisms and that's why it's the number one weed in australia because of those genetics um such a big problem weed and um so you know it, it's, it's, it occurs everywhere because... sorry doris it sounds quite depressing uh for onion growers because you think well there's not much we can do obviously i can't munch up the, the weed seeds uh, like uh, grain growers do that's right so i think it's it's a matter of choosing areas that um have low low weeds um it's, it's a matter of testing to, to find out your baseline it's a matter of applying so if you've got low level resistance or no resistance using herbicides correctly like using like we know that for example with clethodim we know that the ryegrass might be resistant if we spray it at the two to three leaf stage, we kill it. If we spray it at the two tiller stage, which only happen, only it's only a duration of two weeks, we don't kill it because the resistant profile really shows up. So the earlier you can come, the better the control will be, even if it's resistant. And we find that we also find that with glyph say, if um, the ryegrass is sprayed at the two to three leaf stage it is killed even if it's got intermediate to weak resistance mechanisms if you let it kill a route it's much harder to control because the herbicide in a bigger plant has to move more and while it's moving its resistance resistant mechanisms are attacking that herbicide and rendering it inactive in a little plant it gets to all the active sides very quickly and does the job that's a good message. Because so, often a, bit, a, a spray. Stage, I, I can't, yes, I can't stress it enough. I've seen it in the last six months, even in our pot trials, that when we're spraying um, known resistant populations at two to three leaf stage, they are being controlled. Once they get older, they're not controlled. Um, so that understanding also things like clethodim um, is very temperamental to frost, and so. On a day like today, um, say in Arrow Court, where they had that frost, there's, there's beautiful sunshine today. So it gives a false sense of security because the day length is so short that the weeds are stressed. You get sunshine, but the day is so short, the plant doesn't actually recover before it gets cold again and, and gets, it goes into another frost. So if you've had a couple frosts, it's worth giving it some time. I would rather wait another few days and spray it when conditions are a bit better. And that is when things become a bit more cloudy. So the temperature, you don't get those, those sharp differentials in, in temperature and the freezing conditions. So um, absolutely, you have to go in. Clethodim is a herbicide that works very effectively under warm conditions as well. So warm conditions, it works beautifully. So Doris, when would be the main the main target time for applying clethodim in onions? Well, that probably some uh, depends on where you are. Uh, I might just yes. maybe ask uh, if people, instead of a question, give me an answer when, when the main time is for them. Maybe uh, put in your side and when the main time is, and I can let Peter know. So please, if you could do that, and just, mm. you know, on your panel under questions, type in when you would mainly, what time of year you would use that chemical. That would be great. So maybe continue. Yeah, that, would be, that, would be, that, that, that would be good to know. Um, herbicides mm. such as Targa and Fuselade, which are registered in onions, are less temperamental. Um, 
glyphosate is less temperamental. Glyphosate works better under cold conditions than under warm conditions. So it's the opposite of clethidin. So there's a lot of little tricks to knowing um, how herbicides, their behavior, um, so you can get the, the most out of them. But one of the main factors, I'll stress it again, is, is growth stage. The younger you can go, better, better it is. Okay, so at the moment I haven't got any feedback from our audience, but the audience is still uh, that's okay. alive. No, that's okay. I mean, really, the message there is going in during a frost and applying clethidim, mm. um, probably not going to do very much. Even if the weed is um, susceptible, you only, if you're lucky, you'll slow it down. Yeah, but in so some areas, that's the problem. Yeah. Um, here's in Tasmania, generally, Tim Groom said, uh, hang on. Uh, in, in Tasmania, generally, after the broadleaf program is applied, so often uh, the ryegrass is tethering. So it's in Alex, obviously, yeah. started broader here. So very interesting in the comment on grass stage. But we also get uh, a spread of germination of weeds over time. So it is very challenging, uh, you know, because you start yeah. with a broader yeah. program. In, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where it's important to uh, revisit your the residual herbicides to um, see if, if they are registered to be used, um, you know, in the season a little bit too to try and keep that the next flush of germination occurring mm. i know it's a lot of it's a lot of effort but this is where broad acre farmers the what what they've had to resort to is to to go in and, and they're using things like um say th their practice would be to use a knockdown herbicide and a lot of growers are going into using paraquat because of they suspect glyphosate resistance so early rains this year uh paraquat using paraquat, then at sowing, um, using residual herbicide, um, two, if possible, combination, mixture for ryegrass, and then as that crop is starting to grow, putting another residual herbicide to extend the duration, and then um, hopefully if they've got an opportunity to control with a selective herbicide in the crop, which most do not, um, they they then wait for crop competition and then at, towards the end of the season they might be targeting depending on what crop it is if it's a, a pulse crop such as beans or peas or fava beans um, lentils lupins they might be targeting the flowering ryegrass to sterilize it with paraquat so the seed that's set is not fertile and so hopefully next year they won't have any seed set from that particular season okay. so uh, that might be a, uh, something that will work in Tasmania where we have a uh, good crop rotation. It might be harder in other areas. So, for instance, also in Tasmania, it's pointed out, and it's clear that the planting time is quite long. So, depending on when you plant, mm. you might get the issues with frost if you plant. So, so it might be a, a paddock selection to consider ryegrass resistance uh, by selecting the timing in the area. For instance, near the cows, we've got areas would, which would hardly ever get frost, and we've got areas where you might, if you're unlucky, have frost, quite a few frost in winter. So, sure. so what you're saying would help maybe in the paddock selection if possible. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, one of the areas in South Australia, down um, southeast, Narrow Court, um, that sort of area, um, they grow a lot of pulse crops there, and there is a lot of resistance there. So Growing um, growing onions down there can be very challenging because if you're in an area which has been has come through um, a pulse crop and they've used clethidim and it's and it's resistant and then you're you're putting an onion crop with very little other choices what do you do so paddock selection like I said Doris is very very important um, and mm. knowing the baseline so you know what you're dealing with before you start is critical. I mean, that's probably something um, I, I don't know. I, don't, yeah. uh, I might ask the audience uh, whether anybody has done uh, testing for herbicide resistance. Uh, it would be interesting to know. Okay. No, another poll question would, would be good is um, 
who, who uses residual herbicides or pre-emergent herbicides um, in onion crops as well, rather than just relying on, um, on clethodim. That's another important question. So there are situations where farmers may have resistance to a target and fuselade, but clethodim still works. So if I was in a if I was in a situation in the field where I had um, little resistance to or no resistance to targa and um, fuselade, I would not use clethodim. I would use those what we call FOP herbicides first. We've got the 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 chemical group is we abbreviate it to FOP FOP herbicides. I would use them first. Because if you get resistance to, to those, the chance is that clethodim will still work. Very high probability it will still work. However, on the flip side, if you come out and just use clethodim, if you get resistance to clethodim, you've automatically got resistance to use laid and target. They won't work. So going using the FOP herbicides first, then using clethodim can, can get you a few extra years of control. I'm assuming that your resistance is increasing. That's good advice. Um, so maybe you can go with the presentation. We've got about six minutes left, uh, but also. Yep. Oh. Okay, yep, uh, no, that's fine. I can sort of wrap up and just discuss a few things. Um, yeah, so. Maybe we can, maybe there's a question. Hopefully, we haven't any new questions. And. Um, Actually, I can't drive the power from my computer, so that was done in the background by Teresa. So we might just um, do the power separately. Ah, there it is. Very good. Could people please uh, have a quick answer? Okay. So while we're having that answer, yeah, just um, to show what my website looks like um, there. Um, yeah. If, if you're a first time user on the website, first time user on the website and you're sending, oh, that's good. Yeah, 50%. That's excellent. That's really that's good. Right. That's really good to see. Um, it means that growers have got an, an indication of um, what the issues are. Um, so you, you can choose either a seed test or a quick test, depending on what, what you've got there uh, through the website. And that'll give you that baseline sensitivity. So, as I mentioned, herbicide just complicates the hell out of weed control with ryegrass being um, the number one problem. So if, you, if you've been using the same herbicide, even if it's still working excellent, congratulations, don't use it again. Use another mode of action. So anything that's developing resistance to that previous herbicide, is killed with that other mode of action herbicide that um, is going to be used. So you stop resistance in its tracks before it increases too much. Um, and as a the, the easiest way to, to set yourself forward is to actually to determine if you've got resistant weeds present and um, from there work out what mode of action, what mode of action will best fit. Because if, if the test comes back, if you've randomly picked weeds, ryegrass, seeds, or plants from a paddock and sent it to me and not one individual is killed with clethodim, then you know that you, there's, there's, it's going to be an absolute failure. So it might warrant you to use some other chemistry, um, some more residual herbicides, or if it's really bad, not grow in that particular area and choose another area. So testing might be a way to test different areas. Um, and, and see which ones are best suited to grow a following onion crop. Yes. Um, is there actually a question uh, about whether you have any experience with uh, an active ingredient called ethyl fumicide? I hope I pronounce it right. Ethyl yep, fumicide. Yep, ethyl fumicide. Yep. No, that's a. It's a group J herbicide, and there is some resistance to that chemistry. 
but it's not very common. And um, the the one the herbicide that you can, in for controlling there is a cousin to that herbicide called um, carb, and that one can also be used um, early post-emergent to control ryegrass following a rainfall event. Now, if you're irrigating, then you can control the rainfall event. So I'm not I'm not sure if um, if a fumicide has any post-emergent activity, but if it does, then that might be another a mode of action to sort of um, control control ryegrass that's just starting to germinate. So putting it um, over that little seedling and wash it down into the root zone because it's it's soil active, absorption through the roots, and then it um, it, it dies. Okay, so it appears so that, that timing timing is really important. The first thing is not knowing what the problem might be, timing, mm. uh, and having a plan a, a little yeah. bit once you know what the problem could be and at the time of you know, what what you have available. Yeah, no, planning is critical. Um, if your yeah, growers have to farm farmers uh, broad acre farms have to their rainfall event is. Um, governed by what falls from the sky. And so they have to time their residual apl applications where possible <clears throat> to do that. So growers that will put in a residual herbicide pre-emergent before they, or while at the same time assigning the crop, um, then three or four weeks later, when they start to get um, little seedlings of weeds popping up, I'll then apply another, another residual herbicide, but only if there's a rainfall event happening because if there's no rainfall event then it won't wash down into the roots and you won't get control okay um, if you can turn on some irrigation to help that along that'll greatly help um, weed control absolutely okay we might have one uh, more question it's actually also of the audience uh, audience so i just do that and see what people have as an answer So could could you please just let us know? So everybody is oh, obviously. What was the question, Doris? I missed the question. Oh, I, I can share the results and you know the questions. So it's do you use strategic alternatives to uh, consulting? Yep. So everybody yep. does, which is good. Yep, I do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and still, ryegrass is the number one problem because it's it's just escaping. It's getting around around a lot of the other strategies. So it's it's a yeah, it's everyone's problematic weeds. Mm. So um, uh, we have out of time, kept, there are a lot more keeps us in a job. Keeps a, a lot of uh, researchers employed every year uh, trying to combat re resistance. There are a lot of in, in the cereal broad acre industry, there are a lot of new mode of action herbicides coming onto the market, which kill multiple resistant ryegrass that is a real benefit and that's why um, cereal and broad acre farmers are doing quite well some of those herbicides may also be tolerated in onions and it would be so peter you you suddenly um we can't hear you anymore It's, Peter, can you hear me? No. Well, um, if anybody is still listening, uh, so we obviously lost Peter for some reason. He said he had a bad internet connection. Uh, if there's any further questions, uh, please email them to um, Teresa or myself, uh, and we will answer them in due course. So thanks everybody for participating. And uh, so we've finished the webinar. Thank you.